Sabrina is an activist, former educator, and host of the Savvy Sabs podcast. She is also co-host of the Revolutionary Blackout Network. Sabrina spent most of her childhood growing up in Germany and saw many benefits of leftist policies. Sabrina does leftist commentary and interviews activists, candidates, and entrepreneurs, and other change makers fighting political and social issues. And I will add to that that I'm a regular attendee at a lot of her online events and podcasts and uh, um, interviews, and it's always just a pleasure to be there with tens of thousands of others who, who view Sabrina's regular uh, broadcasts. Thank you, Sabrina, for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to have you. So take your choice, cordless or? Probably with the cord. You have to excuse me. I'm short, so. <laughs> uh, good morning and welcome. Thank you guys so much for coming out, or those of you that are watching online as well. Today, I'm going to talk about the cost of living report for 2024. Let's go ahead and get to the next slide. Just want to hit on the agenda here first, really quick. We're going to discuss the Massachusetts cost of living for 2024. So we're gonna start with our state first. Then we're gonna dive into the out of reach report for 2024, a living wage, private equity, solutions, and then Q and A. So first and foremost, how many of you remember the 08 housing crisis? Raise your hand. Did you know that today we not only have a housing crisis, but we have a cost of living crisis? And that's what I want to dive into a little bit here today with a little bit of uh, audience participation. Raise your hand if you grew up in Massachusetts. Oh, not everyone. Okay. Raise your hand if you moved to Massachusetts, if you were a transplant. Yeah, me too. Okay. So for those of you that grew up in Massachusetts, you can probably tell that the cost of living in Massachusetts has greatly increased, right? This is an expensive state to live in, but it's not the only one. And for those of you, if you're like me and you moved to Massachusetts, most likely you probably came from a state that was less expensive than Massachusetts. Am I correct? Where did you come from? Uh, Kansas. Okay. There you go. That's, that's a big difference. Big difference. So why is this important? Did you know that the recent cost of living report shows that Massachusetts has the second highest housing wage in the United States? Now, this was not the case last year. We have now bumped up ahead of the state of New York, but it's not just about Massachusetts. And we're gonna dive into why there are certain reasons why this is happening across the country. But if you live in the Boston area or if you've lived in the Boston area, I'm pretty sure you know that rent is very expensive. It's just a reality. But if we look a little bit deeper, you'll notice something else. Massachusetts, according to the out of reach report for 2024, the minimum wage in this state is $15 an hour. And I point that out because there is a big push for a fight for 15. We already have that here, and it's still expensive to live here. Right now, if you make $15 an hour, you would have to work 98 hours a week to afford a modest one bedroom rental in Massachusetts. Now, for those of you that live here, that probably does not sound unusual, right? This is why a lot of people have roommates. But there's something else I wanna show you. In order to afford a two bedroom rental in Massachusetts, you would need to make $44.84 an hour. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that live in Massachusetts, particularly in the Boston area that are not making over $44 an hour. And if we dive just a little bit deeper, you'll see something else. 
facts about Massachusetts, minimum wage, $15 an hour. The average renter wage is $28.70 an hour. Again, you would need to make $44.84 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental in Massachusetts. But if you look at the most expensive areas, I think this is a very telling piece. Boston, Cambridge, and Quincy area. This is where the price will start to change. If you live in that area, you actually need to earn $54.37 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental. Notice it increases as you go to certain areas. Nantucket County, $48.58 an hour. Easton, Renham, I have no idea where that is by the way. Uh, $48.08. Dukes County, $41.46. And Barnstable, which I think you can't see. It's a little, this little thing here. Let me move this up out of the way. Barnstable Town, $40.04 an hour. The problem is, it's not just Massachusetts. It's easy to start with this state, but as we dive into the report, you're going to see that this is a trend that is happening all across the country. The National Low Income Housing Coalition releases a report every July. It is called the Out of Reach Report. They have been sounding the alarm about the cost of living crisis for years. This is not something that started with 2024. The reality is that Americans have been playing catch up. A $15 minimum wage is not going to fix this. And this is why I really wanted to have this discussion because there's been a lot of talk about a $15 minimum wage, which I think we do need to increase the minimum wage. But that in itself is not going to fix the cost of living crisis that we have in this country. First, I wanna dive into what caused this and how do we resolve it? It's really important that we get into solutions as well. So as we go into this report, I'm just gonna share my screen here. If you see me play with this on my channel before, this is not unusual to you. You've seen this before probably, but a lot of people have not. A lot of people don't know about this report. We're going to start with the state of California. There are a couple of states here that I do want to highlight, and there's a reason for that. California has the highest housing wage in the country. In California, you would need to make $47.38 an hour to afford a two-bedroom rental. We'll go into a little bit more details here. As you can also see, that the current minimum wage in California is $16 an hour. So they're above the 15 minimum thres threshold. You would need to make, if you make $16 an hour, you would need to work 96 hours a week to afford a one bedroom rental. That's California. So what we are seeing in across the board, most expensive state, highest cost of housing, already over the $15 minimum wage but you would still need to earn $47.38 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental in California. And then we'll go a little bit deeper here when we get into the details because California, like Massachusetts, also has higher areas, areas that are more expensive. And what is interesting about California in particular is that notice that Los Angeles is not listed as one of the most expensive areas. Instead, what you have is Santa Cruz, Watsonville, $77.96 an hour. That's what you need to make in that area to afford housing. This is insane. San Francisco, $64.60 an hour. This is going into the tech bubble. San Jose and Sunnyvale and Santa Clara, $60 an hour. Santa Maria, Santa Barbara, 40, 57, excuse me, and 58 cents an hour. Salinas, $55, a little over $55 an hour. That's California. And I point out California because the danger that I notice now that Massachusetts is now number two, California is showing you what not to do. 
and we are headed in that direction. But it's not just California. The next state that I want to look at is Florida because I want to prove a point. A lot of times people will see this and they'll point out the fact that it's just the blue states. It's the Democrat states that are expensive. That is actually not the case. When we go to Florida, we are seeing that Florida has the 10th highest housing wage. In Florida, you need to make $35.24 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental. We'll get into a little bit more details here with Florida. Right now, the current minimum wage in Florida is $12 an hour. So they haven't reached the $15 threshold, but they're getting close to there. You would need to work 98 hours a week in Florida to afford a one bedroom rental. Now, this is Ron DeSantis state, correct? This is Ron DeSantis state, the same governor who told you that California is a problem, is too expensive, but Ron DeSantis doesn't want to mention to you that his own state is becoming unaffordable. Ron DeSantis told police officers to move to Florida. We will pay you more money. If you live in these blue states, come to our state and we will pay you more. Ron DeSantis is adding to the problem. If we look a little bit deeper with Florida in particular, the most expensive areas, Miami, Miami Beach, Kendall, you would need to make $44.69 an hour. West Palm Beach, Boca, $42.81 an hour. Monroe County, $41.13 an hour. Fort Lauderdale, $40 an hour. Orlando, Kissimmee, this is the Walt Disney area. You need to make over $35 an hour. And the reason I point out Ron DeSantis is to prove a point. A lot of people are going to tell you that the solution is to move. That if you live in an expensive state, you need to move to a more affordable state. But Florida is the perfect example that you should not do that. Florida has become more expensive over the years because there has been an influx of people moving to Florida from states like Massachusetts, New York, Washington State, California. That is why Florida has increased. And we can also get into another discussion another day about Walt Disney as well. So that does not solve the problem. Florida used to be a swing state. I think we can all say Florida's a red state. Next, we're going to go to Colorado. And I point to Colorado for a reason as well. Colorado is not on the coast. The most expensive states tend to be on the West Coast or the East Coast. But Colorado, for whatever reason, is ranked eighth highest housing wage. So what happened to Colorado? This isn't a state that has like a huge tech bubble, which we see on the West Coast and the East Coast. We have it here in Massachusetts. We see it in California, Washington State, etc. But something happened here. In Colorado, you would need to earn $37.47 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental. If we go into a little bit more details, you'll see here as well, Colorado, the current minimum wage is $14.42 an hour. They're almost at $15 minimum wage. You would need to work 85 hours to afford a one bedroom rental. And by the way, this is a modest rental. This is not like a luxury one bedroom apartment. This is Colorado. Now, if we look at the most expensive areas in Colorado, we're seeing similar patterns here. Eagle County, $44.60 an hour. This is what you would need to make. Summit County, $42.69 an hour. Boulder, $42.63. Denver, Aurora, Lakewood, $42.33. Pitkin County, $39.62. The trend that we are seeing in all of these states is that the areas that seem to have the most jobs are the areas that are the most expensive. 
Okay. This is where people are more likely to move to. If I were to make a guess with Colorado, I would assume that part of the influx into the Denver area a couple years ago, this was a trendy place to move to, uh, could have something to do with that. But Colorado is one that really needs to be studied in particular. Now we're going to go further south. We're going to go to the state of Georgia. Georgia is also, oh, I guess a swing state now, but typically it was a red state for the most part. Even in Georgia, down south, 20th highest housing wage. In Georgia, you need to earn $28.98 an hour to afford a two-bedroom rental. If we go into the details here with Georgia, and I can explain what I think happened with this particular state. The current minimum wage in Georgia is $7.25 an hour. It is the federal minimum minimum wage. You need to work 140 hours a week to afford a one bedroom rental in Georgia. If we look at the most expensive areas, same pattern, Atlanta, Sandy Springs, Roswell, $35 and 46 cents an hour. Savannah, $27. Gainesville, 26. Morgan County, 25. Butts County, 24. There have been an influx of people moving to the Atlanta area. There's entertainment businesses there. There's a lot of jobs in the Atlanta metro. But the fact that the minimum wage in Georgia is still listed as $7.25 an hour, that is not okay. Georgia's one of them. Then we have two more we want to look at, and I'm going to point to Texas, the red state of Texas, because Texas is 23rd highest housing wage. You would need to make $27.88 an hour to afford a two-bedroom rental in Texas. Texas, if we can go into the details here, make sure I'm hovering over this correctly. So we can look at the most expensive areas here in Texas. And what's interesting about this particular state, there's two things that are going on uh, in Texas. Number one, Texas has, there are certain cities in Texas, I believe that state has the most cities that are the most, uh, have the highest employment rate. So in Texas, you have Austin, Dallas, Houston is a big one. If you look up the top uh, 10 cities where people are moving to for employment, Texas has, I think, four of them in the top 10. But Texas also has the same problem that Georgia has. The current minimum wage in Texas is $7.25 an hour. You would need to make 100, work 129 hours in Texas to afford a one-bedroom rental apartments. If we look at a little bit more detail here, the most expensive areas, we are seeing the same trend. Austin Round Rock, $37 an hour. Dallas, $33. Kendall County, $32. Fort Worth, Arlington, $31. Midland, $31. The other problem with Texas in particular has been a huge influx of California residents moving to Texas. This is causing the cost in Texas to increase. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. And last but least, we're going to look at one that uh, people may not think to look at, and that's Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is the lowest cost of all. They are ranked 52nd highest housing wage. You need to make $11.58 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental in Puerto Rico. Now I know people are gonna hear that and say, let's all move to Puerto Rico. Like, what are we waiting for? But I will explain to you why, again, that is a temporary solution, not a permanent <laughs> solution. In Puerto Rico right now, the current minimum wage is $10.50 an hour. The minimum wage in Puerto Rico is higher than the minimum wage in Georgia and in Texas. Let that sink in for a second. In Puerto Rico, you need to work 39 hours a week to afford a one-bedroom rental. 
And if we look a little bit closer at the details here, again, just like the other, you will see the most expensive areas, San Juan, Ferrado, Mayaguez, uh, Barranquitas, and Ponce. Again, these are the most expensive areas, but look at it. $12.85 an hour, $11.85, or just over $10, $10, $9.40 an hour. So Puerto Rico are uh, very affordable. Um, but the reality is Puerto Rico or everyone moving to Puerto Rico is not the answer. It's not the long-term answer. You will start to see the same problem happen in Puerto Rico that you're seeing happen in Florida, Georgia, Texas, etc. So we can go back here. So getting back to this point here, what caused this and how do we solve it? We need to start with the minimum wage. The federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Remember, this is the least amount that you can pay someone by law. Minimum wage increases have been made through the states. We've had them here in Massachusetts. But according to the outer reach report that I just showed you for 2024, a $15 minimum wage at this point is not enough. When was the last time that the minimum wage was increased? Let's take a look at the history of increases of the minimum wage. This is from the US Department of Labor. In 1996, there were amendments that increased the minimum wage to $4.75 an hour on October 1st, 1996 to $5.15 an hour, September 1st of 1997. Then we wanna fast forward here to 2007, second paragraph. The 2007 amendments increased the minimum wage from $5.85 an hour effective July 24th, 20, 2007, and then $6.55 an hour, which was effective July 24th in 08. And then $7.25 an hour, which was effective July 24th, 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, the minimum wage has not increased since 2009. It is 2024. So let's pretend it did. If the minimum wage increased every year since then, that would roughly put us at about $15 an hour. That's where the $15 comes from. But according to that out of reach report, a $15 minimum wage at this point is not enough. There's a picture there of Professor Richard Wolf because even Professor Richard Wolf would tell you this is not enough. The problem with the minimum wage is that it does not adjust for inflation. So what should we be discussing? A living wage, a minimum wage versus a living wage. The minimum wage is the least amount a worker can earn by law. Right now that's $7 and 25 cents an hour. But a living wage is based on the cost of living and would prevent families from entering poverty. We have to change our focus. I noticed throughout the years, and I'm guilty of this as well, we continue to discuss the fight for 15. We need a $15 minimum wage. But what we're doing is we're fighting for the least amount a worker can be paid. We should be fighting for more. We should be fighting for a living wage. So we have to change our focus. We have to stop focusing on a $15 minimum wage and start focusing on a living wage. And you can see in the picture here with a living wage, notice the scale is balanced. As long as we are focusing simply on the, the minimum wage, we're, we're gonna continue, excuse me, <clears throat> to have a problem with poverty in this country because again, the minimum wage does not adjust for inflation. So that's one of the reasons how we got here as a society. This country is not paying workers a living wage. And then there's another reason. There's something called private equity firms. 
Raise your hand if you're familiar with private equity firms. A couple people, okay. This one kind of just snuck under the radar because now according to ProPublica, private equity is now the dominant form of financial backing among 35 largest owners of multifamily buildings. You could live in a building that is owned by a private equity firm and you may not even know it. Private equity firms increase rent and oftentimes they'll decrease services and amenities, by the way. You'll see that in a second. There's a video that I want to play. If you can cue that up, Amar. To show you a little bit more about private equity uh, and what has been happening in this country. This video, this uh, new segment here was two years ago. So it has increased since then. Rent is on the rise in cities across the country. Tonight, skyrocketing rents, forcing a growing number of Americans to think twice about where home is. It's been making news for months. Rent is up. Rental prices increasing more than 30% in major cities across the U.S. There's a handful of reasons for the surge, but experts say one in particular is key, private equity firms. Private equity firms raise money from institutional and accredited investors, so not just from any ordinary person. Those funds are then invested in different types of assets with the aim of getting a return on investment. A lot of these private equity backed firms really moves into the apartment market, the multifamily market in a big way after the last housing crisis. They also moved into the single family market. What they do is they go out and they find these buildings. They typically make some changes quickly to try to increase the profit. Vogel, a housing reporter with ProPublica says private equity firms increase profit by raising rent and cutting other building expenses. You know, maintenance, security, all those sorts of important things that people really rely on to live in these buildings comfortably. Tenant advocates like Sofia Lopez say those money saving measures for equity firms cost tenants. The tenants have told me stories about having to live without working heat in the dead of winter in some pretty cold places like Minneapolis. In one case, a tenant told me a story about water that was over an electrical outlet and needing the power to be turned off and the company telling her that she'd have to turn it off herself, which would have required her to wade through standing electrified water. Beyond safety concerns, there's the issue of affordability for renters and home buyers. The median home price in the U.S. hitting a high of $416,000 in June. With rising mortgage rates and expensive house costs, slowing home sales and pushing many to rent. Nationwide, the average rent for a one-bedroom, $1,701, while a two-bedroom is $2,048. That's a more than 25% increase since last year. As rents drastically increase, experts like Vogel say private equity firms are a main reason why. In February 2022, Vogel found that private equity firms play a major role in the rental market. Vogel reporting how mortgage finance companies like Freddie Mac are fueling the rise in housing costs. Since 2015, Freddie Mac gave billions to these firms, including real estate company Graystar. Most of us in the industry are getting very aggressive in driving expenses down. Here's Graystar CEO discussing his firm's ability to cut costs back in 2010. We can drive dramatic savings out of the expense side of the equation. But residents worry private equity firm savings will come at a cost, pricing them out of previously affordable homes. So you guys get the get the picture there. The private equity firms, they kind of flew under the radar. A lot of people don't know about it. Uh, and if you can talk to other tenants, they probably tell you they had no idea that their apartment building was owned by a private equity uh, firm. I'm gonna bring up the slideshow here. So private equity is a big problem. And you'll see that some of the ones that were mentioned there, I want to show it here as well. Again, ProPublica was warning people about this. Graystar, private equity, yes. Lone Star, Starwood Capital. And then I think the other one at the bottom is KKKG. All private equity. 
These borrowers that are highlighted white, Southern Management and Irvine Company are not private equity. But the reality is a lot of people just don't know. It kind of reminds me of BlackRock, right? A lot of people just don't know what BlackRock is or what they do. But once you start researching, you find this out. This is why the quality of housing has decreased in a lot of these apartment buildings. This is why the rent continues to increase even during the pandemic when there were some mayors, particularly in Massachusetts, that said we were not going to do that. Uh, We have lost control on the housing issue in this country because private equity firms have found a way to buy in. Now, this is important because when we get to solutions, I broke this up into two different sections, temporary solutions and long-term solutions. So the two problems I brought to you is we don't have a living wage, we need a living wage in this country, and the private equity firms that are pricing everybody out. And one thing I wanna mention about private equity as well, again, they're not just buying apartment buildings, they're buying single family homes as well. This is why a lot of college graduates can't afford to buy a single family home. They are buying those homes, they are renovating them, they jack up the price, and they sell them to other investors. That's why it's hard for you to buy a home. So we have to change the talking point of there's not enough housing. Even if you look at a city like San Francisco, that is not the case. There is vacant housing that is available, but the city is not choosing to house people in the vacant housing. So this idea of we just need to build more homes, that does not solve the problem. There is plenty of housing. There's plenty of vacant housing that is not being used. So these temporary solutions, the first one, move to a cheaper state. That can help you in the short term. One of the pros of that is, again, you'll have a lower cost of living in the short term. But one of the cons is that an influx of transplants will increase the demand. The demand will increase the cost of living. You can look at Florida, you can look at North Carolina, and I myself have lived uh, in those southern states that were more affordable, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and I can tell you that over time you saw the change because as more people move in, the demand is going to increase. When the demand increase, the cost of living is going to increase. So that's a short-term solution. There was an article written by the Boston Globe recently where they were advising college graduates to leave Massachusetts and move to Michigan. And I'm sorry, that is not a long-term solution. What again is going to happen to Michigan is that Michigan again will start to become unaffordable. So we have to look bigger. Another temporary solution, earn an advanced degree. Go back to school. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard that one before. Just go back to school and get another degree, right? So the pros about that is you can get a possible salary increase. And I say possible because it depends on which profession you're in. I was in education, our increases weren't that much. So just being honest. Uh, But the con about this is that this can cause an increase in student loan debt um, and the cost of living may be worse while you're in school. For a lot of us that went to grad school, you're not going to be able to work as many hours when you're not in school. So you'll have to struggle there for those couple of years while you do go back to school. And the last one, job hop. This is another one that um, a lot of Gen Z kids have been doing, no fault of their own. Staying at a company for a year or a couple of months and then going to another company so you can get that pay increase, Right. Now, a lot of times this can be a generational thing. I think sometimes like those from an older generation, they look at that and they're saying, why are these kids not staying here for longer than one year? A lot of that has to do with cost of living. They know that they can get a higher increase in their pay if they leave that job after a year and they're hired by another company. That's how you get the biggest increase, by the way. It's leaving the company you're at and going to another one. So the pro with that is a salary increase. The con about that though is, as I mentioned, some employers are gonna frown upon job hopping when they look at your resume. Someone will say, why were you only there for a year? Uh, And then there's the issue of retirement funds. 
So if you are investing in 401k, every time you choose to go to a different company, that is also going to be an issue. In some cases, you can just transfer it over. That can be complicated depending on which company you worked at. Uh, and in other cases, you may not be able to, and they'll tell you you have to cash out. We can have another discussion one day about 401k because there's studies that are showing that uh, a lot of younger adults are choosing not to opt into a 401k because they can't afford it. But in the end, we need to look at long-term solutions. The first one is we need to demand a living wage. So as I said before, we have to change our focus. We cannot continue to just say, fight for 15 minimum wage. Again, we're asking politicians, we're begging them to give people the least amount you can pay a worker uh, by law, right? So we need to ask for more. We need to demand a living wage. What is the method of doing this? We can do this on the state level or on the federal level. My advice, it might be easier to try to start at the states. I think we've seen here in Massachusetts, we're a ballot initiative state. We've passed a number of progressive measures here in Massachusetts because we're a ballot initiative state. So those are two different ways to do that, the method. And what are the pros? A, a living wage adjusts to the cost of living. That's the big one. One of the cons corporations could increase prices. And I have to be honest with you about that. The moment they see that we are making more money, corporations could decide, let's increase the price of gas. Let's increase the price of milk. You see it right now at the grocery stores, right? So that's just an honest reality. The second uh, long-term solution, and this is a big one, we need to outlaw private equity firms from owning housing. That is probably one of the, the best methods that we can use. And how can we do this? It may be easier by the state level and you can do it via ballot initiative, meaning you can run a ballot measure in any of your states, run a ballot measure that is going to outlaw private equity from owning housing, period. Because they're not going to stop. And there's no limit to that, apparently. So that's a big one. To add to that ballot measure in a state like Massachusetts, which is an indirect ballot initiative state, which means that these measures have to be approved by the legislature and then it can go to the ballot. We would probably need to uh, change something within our amendment here in Massachusetts where we can uh, overturn this idea that the legislator has to approve these ballot measures before they're put on the ballot because there are states like California that's a direct initiative state, they don't have to go through the legislature. They meet the petition requirements and it goes directly on the ballot. So we could do the, that as a combination. What are the pros? It prevents overpriced departments and rent surges. Plain and simple. One of the cons, this will not be easy. Uh, easier path is probably done through the states, but it will not be something that is easy to do, but it needs to be done. And the last long-term solution that I would recommend is rent stability or rent control. We can do this through the state or the federal level. Uh, right now, I believe there are a number of people that are calling for this through the federal level because the rents are just, it's just ridiculous. One of the pros again, preventing rent surges. One of the cons is you may receive landlords that the pushback from the landlords, right? Because once we do some type of rent control, that means that the landlords are going to make less money uh, and they have people they have to pay to. So let's just keep that in mind. But these are the long-term solutions. And I've done a lot of research about this. Um, I think that we just been looking at this from a smaller lens. And I think we need to take a step back and look at this from a wider lens because in the end, the way that things have been going, this cost of living crisis, this is not sustainable. It is only a matter of time where more people are going to be evicted, more people are going to be homeless, uh, and the cost of living crisis is a big part of that. Thank you. Let's maybe have a conversation with, with Sabrina. Yeah? My first question, Sabrina, while you're coming up here is, is it, is it conceivable that you could 
pass a vote, uh, a ballot uh, banning private equity firms from owning property. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like, we could pass a ballot banning aid to Israel, except there's APAC. And I'm sure there's a similar real estate lobby that is in the same position. So that's, that's my question for you. Good question. Uh, so yes, uh, I think that again, with the ballot measures, one thing we have to remember is it would be up to us, the people. So we would be the ones that would be voting on that. Uh, there is some education that would have to take place, just to be honest, because I would not be surprised if the Massachusetts legislature would try to find a way to word that to confuse people. So that would mean that it would require those who ran that ballot measure to go out in the community and explain to people what private equity is, what's happening, and how we can, you know, how to answer that question the right way. Uh, now to your other point about the money, uh, that is a very real reality, right? Like we know that money controls electoral politics. Uh, this is why I also add that there should be another component to this where particularly in this state of Massachusetts, this is an indirect ballot measure state. So what that means is that uh, once the volunteers have collected all the signatures that they need for uh, a ballot measure question, it is then turned over to the legislature and they decide whether or not that question will go on the ballot. We need to cut that part out. So what we could do is we could try to overturn the um, amendment to file an amendment to change that rule here in Massachusetts and other places have done this where we can change it to make Massachusetts a direct ballot measure state like California. This is why California will have like what 14 ballot measures on the ballot because it's direct. So if they get all the signatures, all of it just goes on the ballot. They don't have to deal with the legislator, right? So I think it's a twofold when it comes to Massachusetts, uh, but it doesn't have to start with this state. It would probably be easier to have that start with California, to be honest with you, um, because they they have a direct initiative and they're able to get as many, a lot of them on the ballot. Um, so I think with this state though, we would have to do two things. We would need to, file an amendment, pass an amendment to overturn the current rule with ballot measures, which means that it has to be approved by the legislator before it's on the ballot first. We would need to change that. Uh, and then we can run that ballot measure to outlaw private equity from owning uh, housing. Calvin. Yes, hi. Well, while you were going through your presentation, I couldn't help but think, well, I want to mention first that I'm, I consider myself very grateful because 30 years ago, I, I, uh, I bought into a limited equity co-op here in the city of Boston, just about a block away from Symphony Hall, right in the center of town. And, and uh, limited equity co-ops, we own four buildings, 22 units, and uh, our, our uh, mortgage is, is uh, a nominal $500,000 split amongst 22 different units. And, and uh, I've been there 30 years, and we've only had a couple of small rent increases. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, I went to a meeting some 20 years ago, and I, I learned that there were about 15,000 units here in Boston of limited equity co-ops. And uh, that, that's a sizable number. And if that could grow somehow, you know, if more, more people could g gather together and buy into uh, you know whether that would be an alternative i think i think that's a great idea um and this is another thing uh, people have proposed this idea in activist groups before about uh, a group of people getting together and let's say you have 50 people and everybody put in like a hundred dollars or something like that and you know did what you did like went into uh the co-op uh, realm that's another option that you can do and i think um it's, it's a little bit, I feel like uh, nowadays it's a little bit trickier to do it here in Boston because I feel like we have a limited amount of time uh, throughout the year. And you guys can let me know if you feel this way too, but I feel like we have a limited amount of time throughout the year. Whereas it seems like here, once winter hits, people kind of retreat. <laughs> retreat. Like it's, it's harder to get people to come out and, and to organize, et cetera. But um, I think that's a great idea. And I, I mean, like looking back on it, it's it's crazy to me when I think about the cost of housing. Um, 
I, I come from a family where my parents did not go to college. They didn't have to. Uh, and they were able to raise me and my sister and we did very well. My mother was able to stop working when she had me until I went to kindergarten. My parents didn't have to pay for daycare. My mom was able to stay home with me uh, until I was going to school and then go back to work. And nowadays, that is not the case for most people, even those with college degrees. So uh, there, there has been a problem, particularly in this country where it seems like you can't get by just with a regular Joe Schmo job. And, and you should be able to do that. You shouldn't have to go to college. But now we're seeing that even if you have a college degree, you still are struggling. So this is the, the warning I've been trying to signal to people is that this is not sustainable. And I, I don't, it doesn't matter what politician is in the White House. People have to understand. It doesn't matter if it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. If we can't stop private equity from owning housing, this is still going to be a problem. If we can't give the American people a living wage, this is still going to be a problem. Ed, welcome. Hi. Um, my name's Ed Pazanese. I'm a member of the community church and the board. Um, I live in a building uh, in Jamaica Plain for 17 years. It's privately owned, so you know what that means. They own 14 properties. Um, and when it was created by the family, it was designed for um, elders and people with disabilities 50 years ago. Now, if anybody moves, it's market rate at $2,800 for one bedroom, $3,500 for a two bedroom. So they're working hard to displace people fast. Um, and so, where do people go when there's not affordable housing? Correct. Um, just, you know, that, yeah. That's yeah. And this is a common situation that I continue to hear over and over. I, I spoke with residents at uh, what used to be Bromley Heath Apartments, which are now the Mildred Healy. Uh, yeah. So they are, uh, the city has decided to demolish uh, that area and they are just displacing those residents in different parts throughout the city. Um, it's, it, it, it's really shameful to like take someone from their home, their community and just uproot them and say, and just plop them down somewhere else and say, this is your home now. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sad, but, um, that's just one example. Uh, Grant Manor is, is another example. Jamaica Plain, unfortunately experienced a great wave of gentrification. And I believe that's part of the problem that you see in JP. Once the Whole Foods came in, once the breweries came in, and don't get me wrong, I like my breweries, but once those things came in, the community started to change and it became um, unaffordable for a lot of people that grew up there. But to your point, where do those people go? That's a good question. Um, what I have seen happen is that people are moving further and further away from the city. They're moving to places that are more affordable. They're moving to the North Shore, the South Shore. Even Quincy isn't really affordable anymore, by the way. Um, so they're moving further away, which also means that they are most likely to have a longer commute. That's just the reality. The further away you move, most of us work within the Boston area. Now you have a longer commute. Some people have moved to Worcester. I, that's like an hour away, like it, it, but it's, it's, that's what people are doing. And, uh, it didn't just start. I mean, if, if we think back to the history of Boston and we think about how like the North end at one point, it wasn't just like Italian restaurants. It was actually Italian families that lived there, right? Italian American families. What happened to all those families? Where did all those people go? They moved. They got, they were pushed out because the cost of living increased, right? So I think you see this, you can say the same thing for South Boston. You see it in Roxbury. Uh, you see it in parts of Dorchester. It's just happening all over. And so people are moving further and further out. And this is also why for people who are not from the area or you may have come here as a visitor, this is also why you don't hear the Boston accent that much anymore in the city. Because a lot of the people who grew up in Boston that have that accent uh, had to move further out. I've got one for you. Point the, the camera at myself. Um, Sabrina, I have a, a, a room in, in the attic 
It's called the Museum of Obsolete Media. <laughs> it has uh, LPs, it has uh, a million cassettes, and, and now the CDs are going up there and, and uh, VHS. Um, in fact, this, um, this church, uh, this auditorium, is also a museum of obsolete media. We uh, have inherited a mountain of books uh, from Bob Dottilio. The third floor has another mountain of books. Um, and um, you are in the universe of today's media. And you are a, an important, uh, what is it called, content creator, influencer? <laughs> I don't know which name you give yourself, but um, it's, it's a remarkable thing to, uh, to watch in my dinosaur way of, of approaching the laptop and, and clicking on, on you or on other, other similar commentators who are doing like cutting edge interviews with people that I want to hear from. Uh, I just want to ha have you talk about that, what it's like, what, uh, what, is, it, is it a livelihood? Is it, is it possible in, in, this, um, in this new reality to, uh, to, to make a living? Is a, you, do you consider yourself a journalist or, or uh, what's, <laughs> what's the name you give yourself on, online? So okay. some of my viewers will call me a journalist, but I always correct them and say, I do not consider myself to be a journalist. And even though I have written like articles here and there is because I, I do hold uh, journalists to an incredibly high standard. So when I look at someone like Max Blumenthal, for example, I consider to be a journalist, an investigative journalist, for example. So I don't put myself like on that same standard, uh, but I just call myself you know, I, a host of a podcast. Like I'm a podcast host. Some people say content creator. Uh, what is it like? It's changing every day. Um, <laughs> I could tell you when I started uh, three years ago, live streams weren't a big thing. The idea was you create this little short video news clip and then you just upload those videos, right? But as time went by, live streams became more of a, a desire from a lot of viewers. They wanted to be able to interact with the host and not just watch a short clip and leave a comment. So I had to move with the changes. So in the beginning, I was recording videos. And then when I saw people were like, no, we actually want to interact with the host. Then I switched to doing live streams and cutting those, those news clips from the live stream and uploading them as clips. Shout out to Eric and Corey, my producers, because they helped me with all of that. Um, but, then, but then there's other things as well. You have to figure out what time of day to go live, which that takes practice. You just kind of that's trial and error. You really don't know in the beginning. And it also depends on when you are available. <laughs> so there's that as well. Um, you have to learn how to do the algorithm. And that's probably the hardest part about all of this. Nobody mentors you. And I think this is something a lot of people may not understand. For those of us that started after uh, the Bernie wave, that started the show after the Bernie wave, most of us were not uh, a TYT affiliate. And most of us didn't go through that path or that channel. But a lot of the, the older uh, left commentators did. Either they were a part of uh, the TYT uh, network or they were an affiliate at some point in time. So for those of us that did not go through that, there was no mentor. There was no one that sat us down and said, okay, this is how you do this and this is how you're gonna be, you're gonna grow. Uh, there's no uh, instruction manual that teaches you how to do this. That's the hardest part of all. It, a lot of it is uh, trial and error um, and trying to figure out like when does your audience want to see you live, etc. And if you if you can get like that one video to really like go viral and get a lot of views, that will ultimately help you. Um, but I think the hardest part for those of us that do the news creation uh, on YouTube and, and Rockfin and Rumble is that... Um, a lot of times with the live reactions, you are going to see our, our actual live response. So sometimes there are viewers that uh, may attack attack the host and uh, you will see a real response. So I think that's the other thing with that as well. Let's do one online. Tilly Ruth. Hi, Tilly Ruth. Hi. There you um, are. Now we hear you. Right. Uh, okay. I live 
I live a few blocks away from community church. In the 1980s, there was a government program that was called Urban Homesteading. The building that I live in, and we bought these buildings from the city, believe it or not, for $1,500 a piece. Uh, these are from the, uh, the uh, they were built in the 1870s, brownstones. And I live in a two bedroom, two bathroom uh, a, a unit. And uh, of course, uh, uh, how do you say, it's a place where my grandkids and family come to stay in downtown Boston. Okay, this was financed by uh, grew, um, uh, the, the feds gave us a, a loan, we could use a loan for construction purposes only at 3%. The city gave us a construction manager slash architect. And the provision was that we had to put in considerable hours of work. It was called work equity, which we did. It took us, um, oh, it was a number of years. And at the time, we were putting in 50 bucks a month. Um, the, uh, how do you say, applicants were screened. Um, I would, should say my late husband was one who did the screening, but uh, it was families, all races, all sexual orientation. We, it was quite a mix. Um, Dean can tell you personally, he just visited me a while ago. Okay, uh, we moved in. New Year's Eve, 1984. I swear to you, I think this thing my uh, parents and my husband would turn over in their grave, but it probably will go for over a million to a million and a half on the market. Okay. Hey, um, yes, uh, we are a co-op and we also have a restriction. The restriction is that you have to live in your unit. Uh, if for circumstances, uh, you can uh, rent out for up to two years, but that's it. And uh, that's a restriction. And um, we also were under the Boston Redevelopment Authority for 25 years. Of course, that time is up. Afterwards, our rules uh, we set up that uh, we could we would voluntarily, um, some of us would do say we had to stay affordable. So the definition of this affordable place is over three hundred grand now. <laughs> you know, completely crazy. But um, and we learned skills at the time. I I learned how to tile. I tiled not only with my unit, but I tiled six other units. Um, family and friends put in work hours. Um, one uh, family uh, that had an elderly, the grandmother did the cooking so that uh, on weekends we served meals for people who were working because we were working doing this. But, you know, it took us a while. We did it. And we had to, um, how do you say, no, I know how to cook, but uh, others, uh, yes, I did learn how to tile. My husband had considerable skills uh, in terms of, uh, well, he carpentry and using his hands and et cetera. Um, but we did it and uh, we live in the unit and um, hey, I entertain and <laughs> yes, okay, I'll confess. I'm 93 years old, you know, <laughs> uh, I can't do too much right now, but uh, it's been great. But we learned, you know, this is my neighborhood, you know, and I look out the window and, uh, you know, like I said, we're a couple of blocks from community church. 
and I know my neighbors. And I will say this, you have to talk to people where they are. And I'm not talking politics um, or political party, but like, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, summer, we've been uh, rented for a long time. We went part-time at the Cape and uh, the landlord who owns the place is, uh, we'll call him a Trump supporter. We do not discuss politics. We learned that a long time ago. We do talk ecology because the weather and the global warming affects his land. And uh, the same thing, I can talk to my neighbors. We find out what we have uh, problems that we can deal with uh, as a community. So I, I, Stop me from talking too much. <laughs> Thank you, Tilly. The voice of, of wisdom, the voice of of the elder of our community and uh, and the voice of success in finding housing long ago. And I wonder if there's any similar avenues for young people today. I think you're gonna have to have money. Uh, the reality is like, as particularly we're talking about Boston, you need money and uh, you need some, or you need money with, you need a group of people that are able to put their money together or you need one person that has a lot of money. Uh, that's just the reality. Um, my husband and I, we went through the home buying process here. Uh, we are very familiar with what it's like. And I will tell you, it is absolutely ridiculous um, that post pandemic, the way that the housing costs have increased or have jumped up since then, there's no way I would be able to buy a house now in the same neighborhood. Okay, so we were able to take advantage of the low interest rates like during the the height of the pandemic but the way the housing costs now at like after that like there's no way like if we would have made it i think like that was 2020 so if we would have waited like 2021 there's no way like that, that's insane I, I can't think of particularly long eastern massachusetts i can't think of one place where you can buy a house that's under five hundred thousand dollars i can't think of one uh, and that doesn't mean if it's renovated or if it's an older house or what, but the reality is, particularly with younger people, the way that they are graduating from college right now, they are not paid the wages that they need to make in order to own a home or to uh, do the home ownership process. You have to have the money to put down for the home as well. They're not making enough. And then on top of that, the single family homes are continuing to increase. And then I also worry about this idea of everyone becoming forever renters. And I worry about that. And not everyone wants to be a renter. Uh, some people do, but there's something about being able to have that ownership. Uh, not only that, but that also is a part of your net worth. So if you have a home that you own, that contributes to your net worth. But I, I greatly worry about this idea of everyone becoming a renter. Uh, because that's actually what the ruling class wants, by the way, for people who may not realize. They want everyone to just live in these small box apartments. And at one point that was a trend, but to live in the tiny apartments and to just rent. They don't really want you to own anything. So in, in that respect, you're giving the ruling class what they want. Meanwhile, they can have multiple properties across the world. Thank you so much. And I love this discussion of community land trust models, of the fact that we have tons of properties in Boston that are completely vacant, that could be dedicated toward housing or community, and yet they're being held as investments uh, and not put to good use as well. And I've been a big fan of yours, which is why I came out today. I'm not part of the congregation yet, at least. And I guess I wanted to ask, you know, what motivates you to keep educating people, keep speaking out? I know it can be frustrating. It can maybe sometimes be hard to reach people or, or see that we're not yet doing enough to overcome that, that gap in power that the ruling class has over just about every industry in our society. So I would just love to know a little bit more about what makes you tick, what makes you get up in the morning excited to educate people and, and start these important discussions. Okay. I'm James. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I live in Roxbury now and I work for the city of Boston in my day job. And 
I worked for the legislature for a while too, and, and you're right, those, those wages, uh, a lot of young people are moving out of Boston because we can't afford to live here. Yeah, it's uh, a very good question there. Uh, what motivates me? Um, I think a lot of that just comes from the way that I was raised. I mean, my, my parents uh, always, primarily my dad, my dad always pushed me to, you know, he told me like, no one's just going to give you something just because you do a good job. My dad always told me that like from day one, I, you're not going to, no one's just going to give you a promotion just because you do a good job. So there has to be something about you that's going to stand out to, to get those you know, those gains uh, later on in life. But my parents taught me early on that it, it's really about helping people. So I've been volunteering since I was a kid. That's just kind of how I was raised. Uh, there was the Girl Scouts. There, were, I think a lot of people had the Girl Scout experience at some point, or Boy Scouts, <laughs> shout out to the Boy Scouts as well. Um, there was the Girl Scouts. Uh, there was Habitat for Humanity. There was the Key Club. There was, I mean, all these different organizations that I was a part of, um, and a lot of them were through my school. Uh, so I was always taught that you're supposed to help, like, that's just what you do. You're supposed to help people or you're supposed to, you know, give back. Uh, and also part of that, um, motivation comes from the fact that there has been some growth. There has been some improvement. Um, I just think about where we were, let's go back to 08. I always bring up 08 cause that was the house, the housing crisis here. I just think of where people were. Um, you know, politically in this country, uh, in 08. And I look at where people are now and I, I just, I, I hear people, you know, are, are more engaged with not just domestic policy, but foreign policy. You know, the world has, has woken up to uh, what is happening in the middle East. And that's, that's another thing. Um, a lot of people didn't know about Gaza before October 7th and, this is why sometimes I have to tell myself to get out of my bubble because the reality is uh, people who are not uh, engaged in this space are not paying attention to independent political YouTube. A lot of times they really don't know. So like if, if we bring up something about, well, guess what happened uh, in, in, in Brazil? Like guess what happened with, with foreign, particularly foreign policy? A lot of pe most people are not going to know. And that's, that's just the reality. So after October 7th, when I saw the world kind of rise up and protest, that to me gave me hope. That to me gave me more motivation that like, you know what? People are, are starting to wake up. People are starting to realize that we have to get away from the propaganda. We have to get away from some of these narratives that come from corporate media. Corporate media has a very extremely low rating right now, by the way. Uh, the public, the American public, I just read the article recently, the American public does not trust corporate media more now than ever. That's actually a good thing because that tells me that people are waking up. Um, so I, I just think that's where some of that motivation comes from, uh, the way that I was raised, but also like I, I am seeing improvements like through, and I, not even like politicians, but I mean like everyday people. I am seeing that growth. I am seeing the improvement and also the younger generation, like Gen Z, like they really do, I think, inspire me because I look at them and I realize, you know what? They are not falling for the same propaganda that I did. I'm, I'm a millennial. So and we have all types of things about us, but um, they're not falling for it. And, and they're more willing to just, just tell you, like, we are not going to put up with this. And here's the reason why. And uh, so I get a lot of inspiration from that. Millennials, Gen Zs, and all us, what do they call it? Oh, boomers, boomers. Join in uh, on uh, Savvy Sab's podcast. Um, is there any specific time you've been experimenting that you do a live, a live stream? Yeah, so I'm live on uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday evenings, and every other uh, Sunday evening. That's that's a lot of times that you can find <laughs> Savvy Sabs live online. Uh, just uh, type in her name on your YouTube channel. That's probably the best way to get there. And she told us about Rumble and Rockfin and Rupus and Boopus and Burpus. <laughs> uh, there's all kind of platforms coming up. Uh, at your way, and each one is a little different. Each one has its own set of 
rules, but, uh, but you can find her. You can also find us, Community Church of Boston official. Um, thanks to Amar Ahmad, who has really developed this uh, in a great way. We have 35,000 um, subscribers and uh, a couple of Richard Wolf um, podcasts or, or view, uh, videos that have over a million views. Um, uh, not, not to brag or anything, but uh, uh, we thank you for being here physically as well as online. Um, be in touch with us. We can put you on our mailing list, uh, comchurch at gmail.com, C-O-M-M, church at gmail.com is where you can get on uh, our mailing list or physically hear the, uh, the clipboard that is, is going around. We also rely on your generosity to keep this thing going and to keep our staff nourished and our, our building from leaking, which reminds me that we just got a new roof. Um, somehow we were able to afford in hard times, thanks to the city of Boston and our own resources and our own donors, a brand new roof that we, that we needed for a long time. And thank you, Sabrina, who has been with us today and we so appreciate your presence here with us today.